And let's welcome uh, in-person presenter, Pablo Solana. What is the... Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I am Pablo Solana from the University of Granada in Spain. And in this presentation, I am going to talk about the reliability of the currently available brain stimulation studies of embodied language comprehension. So according to the embodied language comprehension framework, comprehending action-related language requires simulating in detail the content of the language by reactivating the sensory motor areas of the brain. For example, in the seminal study, Hawk and College found that a reading a action related language, hands related and food related verbs like kick or pick, activate the same brain areas involved in performing movement using your hands and using your feet, respectively. However, this kind of evidence uh, has an important limitation, that is that you cannot be sure whether this motor recruitment is really a functional, a core part of semantic processing, or it is just an epiphenomenon or the fruit of post-conceptual processes. So in order to overcome this limitation, more and more studies are using brain stimulation techniques like TMS or TDCS, in order to assess the functional links between motor and language processing. For example, in this study by Logerfo et al., they found that applying repetitive TMS over the hand uh, region of the primary motor cortex, a slower reaction time for verbs and noun-related uh, uh, words, but has no effect whatsoever over abstract words that were not related to action. However, not all the available evidence point out in this direction. For example, in this study by Tomasino and College, they found that applying TMS pulses over the primary motor cortex of the hands uh, negatively affect the comprehension of action verbs, but only when participants were explicitly asked to imagine the content of the language, but not during purely linguistic stacks, for example, in silent reading. We suggest that maybe this motor recruitment is indeed part of post-conceptual processes like motor imagination. So, considering these inconsistent results, and the current replicability and credibility crisis that cognitive science is now suffering make us wonder how reliable as, uh, is uh, this literature. So the main goal of this study was to assess the evidential value, the underlying statistical power, and the presence of publication bias within this set of studies by means of using two different meta-analytic tools. First, your analysis and second test for extent significance. So first, we carry out an extensive uh, and intensive literature search that uh, allow us to identify 43 studies at which TMS or TDCS were used in order to assess the grounding of meaning in the motor system. First, the results of these studies we submitted to peak your analysis. Peak your analysis is a novel meta-analytic tool that is based on how significant p-values distribute. So when there are no effects underlying a set of studies, the distribution of p-values is expected to be flat, meaning that all p-values are equally probable. However, when there are true effects underlying a set of studies, the distribution is expected to be right skew, meaning that those p-values uh, near to zero are more likely than those one next to 0 
and importantly, the degree of the of radius cuteness of the distribution depends upon the underlying power of the set of studies. The more power you have, the more radius cube is expected to be the distribution. But there is a final possible scenario that is finding a left skew distribution, meaning that those p-values near to zero are less probable than those near 2.05, which, which can be suggesting the attempts of the researchers to find significant results in order to get their studies published. Okay. So in our case, this is what we found. You need to focus on the blue line. Uh, this distribution is not significantly flat if you compare with the red uh, dotted line. And on the contrary, this distribution is significantly dry skew. So in principle, this literature contains evidential value. However, if we analyze in more detail the distribution of these p-values, we see that the significance of the dry skewness test depends only in the most p in the most extreme p-value included in the analysis. So if we eliminate this observation, the significance of the ray skewness test completely disappears, which means that we cannot really say that this is a ray skew distribution. So summing up, we have not a ray skew distribution nor a flat distribution, which means that the evidential value of this set of studies is currently uncertain. So we cannot be sure whether these studies are really studying true effect or not. So accumulating more evidence in this line is highly necessary. And the other important result concerning the peak urban analysis is the estimation of the underlying statistical power of these studies. In our case, the best estimator is 29%, which means that around 30% of these studies will replicate in the future. And on the contrary, around 70% of them will not replicate is it repeated exactly the same as the original study, which can be meaning that in fact, the majority of these studies can be reporting false positive results. Uh, one potential explanation for this low power can be the use of a small sample size within these studies. As you can see in this plot, the majority of the studies uses sample size between 10 and 19 participants, and only five of them use sample size greater than 50 participants. In order to assess if there are publication bias within this literature, we also carry out tests for exact significance. These tests compare the observed proportion of significant values, significant findings in a set of studies with the expected proportion of significant findings, or in other words, with it expected uh, power, statistical power. If the observed proportion is significantly greater than the expected proportion, then the test suggests the system of publication bias. In our case, the observed proportion of a statistically significant finding was around 70%, and the expected proportion, the power estimated by our PQ, was around 30%. Those uh, probability are significantly different. So uh, this means that these results can be too good to be true. Or in other uh, words, it suggests the presence of publication bias in these brain stimulation uh, studies. Importantly, all of these results, both the PQ analysis results and the test for a significant, for a significant result, uh, were uh, replicated by using a completely alternative uh, set of p-values from these studies, which suggests that our conclusions are not biased by the inclusion uh, processes. So, in conclusion, the evidential value of the currently available brain stimulation studies of embodied language comprehension is currently unclear. 
some of them may be exploring true effects, while some others may be reporting false positive. The underlying statistical power of this set of studies is very low, which means that probably the majority of them will not replicate in the future. And finally, there is an excess of significant result within these studies, which suggest the presence of any kind of publication bias. So it seems that the currently available brain stimulation studies, TCS and TMS studies that assess the grounding of meaning uh, within the motor cortex uh, seem to do not stand on solid ground. So now what can we do in order to improve this situation? So there we have some recommendation for future research in this line. First, it's highly important to pre-register your hypothesis, sample size, analysis plan, and other kind of uh, researcher degrees of freedom before starting your data collection. Second, it's also crucial to design well-powered studies using, for example, a priori power analysis in order to avoid the presence of both false positives and false negatives. Third, we also recommend to conduct right, direct replication of previously published uh, works. And finally, we contain all the researchers to continue doing meta-analytic work in order to complement the, the price and findings. Uh, this is, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pablo. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Thanks for that. Um, so apologies if you covered this because I did miss the first few minutes, uh, <laughs> but did you do any exploratory analyses of uh, design features of the studies or um, uh, looking at particular labs, sort of like other things that made the presence of p-hacking more or less likely? Like are there, are there sub parts of this discipline that you think are on more solid ground than others on the basis of Coding any okay. Studies. Okay. Uh, in, we don't uh, split our study into different groups. Of course, we could do it, but the problem is that in order to conduct a big urban analysis, a meta analysis in in general, you have uh, to you need to have a lot of power in order to obtain relevant conclusion. So in, in our case, from, for, from these 43 studies, we uh, select 32 significant p-values. Uh, um, it's uh, recommended to use a minimum of 20 of them. So if we split our studies, for example, TVCS studies, single pulse TMS studies, repetitive TMS, theta bar stimulation studies, these little groups will not have enough power to obtain relevant con conclusion. And the other important thing is that because this analysis is not based on uh, effect size, is it, it is based on how p-values distribute. The distribution of p-values is something independent to the heterogeneity of the studies. So in principle, mixing uh, TMS studies with TDCS studies, or for example, studies using verb with studies using noun. In principle, it uh, do not affect the, the conclusion. Okay? So that's the reason why we didn't do that. Um. So do you know how this P-curve analysis compares to other P-curve analyses that have been done of TMS? So is this something that's about the particular tool or is it about the particular content area? Well, there are mm, no... Mm, okay. P-curve analysis is really a, an underused tool. It's not very, very frequent. I think that there is another peculiar 
published in Cortex only with TDCS studies in, in memory, I think. And they obtain very similar conclusion that this field is not reliable uh, at all. Regarding TMS, I don't know any, any study, but maybe mm, there is, uh, but I don't, I don't know. Thank you for your question. We don't have any questions in the chat yet. Lilia, may I? Please. Um, Pablo, nice job. Um, so you mentioned an important distinction uh, in the introduction, and uh, I wonder what happens when you draw this distinction in your in your analysis. And I have a feeling that your answer is going to be we don't have enough uh, uh, studies in the sample to to make such a distinction. But in in this kind of work with with imaging, with behavioral results, with with uh, neurostimulation. You see much stronger effects, as as you noted in the introduction, when people are instructed to explicitly imagine uh, motor actions compared to when you block imagery mm -hmm. uh, or 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 require very shallow processing. Do you do you even anecdotally do you see any distinction uh, in your in your analysis between the explicit imagery versus uh, implicit processing of of uh, the the linguistic stimuli? Uh, well, we didn't do that, but I think the only uh, brain stimulation study that did this distinction is indeed the Tomasino and College studies. Sure, but in the in the whole pool of studies, some of them used uh, shallow processing tasks and some of them used explicit imagery tasks. So you might be able to to see whether that that the, you i would be very surprised if there weren't a distinction in the reliability of i, I would be surprised if, if the reliability of the explicit imagery studies weren't greater uh than the the shallow processing studies yeah sure it is very interesting maybe we can do that in the future we can uh, add this distinction in in the analysis of the possible paper <laughs> okay thank you for your question Danny.